Welcome everybody to another episode of Patho for Nurses. I'm Professor Scott Kruger and today we're going to be going over some sensory disorders, mainly for the eyes and the ears. Uh, talking about the eyes first, one of the things that we want to consider is all the different structures of the eye. So one of the first things I like to think about are eyelashes. Those help to provide a first line of defense against particles that may be incoming. We think about the cornea of our eye, right in the center. We have our iris, which is the colored part of your eye. And depending upon the pigmentation of your iris, people with lighter pigmentations, people with albinism, they may have to protect their eyes a bit more, uh, especially from UV rays like sunlight. Our pupil right in the middle, the dark part, that can adjust with light. So it gets bigger and smaller to allow light to come in. So that allows us to focus on objects that are far away, focus on objects that are near, uh, provide us a sense of somewhat ability to see in dark, darkened areas. Uh, we think about our eyelids. The skin tends to be very thin in that area. We have enzymes in our tears that afford us protection from certain microorganisms. It also helps clear the eye out if something gets in the eye. The white part of our eyeball, that's the sclera, that's the outer layer. A couple of the other layers that we have, we have the retinal layer. That connects right to the vitreous body, and that is really the majority of your eye, is that jelly-like substance, um, the vitreous body of your eye. It gives it shape, it helps keep it um, the retinal layer nourished and also connected and in place. We have our lens. The lens of our eye is very important. And moving into our first couple of disorders, the refractive errors, many times the shape of the lens uh, dictates what kind of, uh, or your potential for having a refractive error. So the first one I wanna talk about deals with hyperopia. And that's a vision condition in which nearby objects are blurry. However, people can see far away. Hyperopia, very common disorder in adults. People with hyperopia may have to squint to see nearby objects. So things like reading, writing, computer work, drawing for long periods of time may cause eye strain. And anytime you have eye strain, you have the potential to have a headache. So that's something to consider. Treatment options for hyperopia include eyeglasses, contact lenses, and then LASIK surgery. Our second refractive error deals with myopia. That's the opposite of hyperopia. So myopia, a condition in which close objects appear clear, but you can't see far away. Uh, that's also known as nearsightedness, tends to be genetic, run in families. So we know that far away objects are blurry with myopia. The condition can develop gradually or it can develop acutely, very rapidly. Treatment options also include eyeglasses, contact lenses, and then Lasix. Our third refractive air, uh, disorder deals with presbyopia and that's lack of elasticity of the lens of your eye. Very common in the aging adult, and that is where gradually uh, our ability to focus is diminished, uh, specifically with close objects. So you may see um, elderly people with presbyopia, they may be holding a menu and they have to hold it a certain distance away from them to be able to read it. So our last refractive error deals with astigmatism. And astigmatism is where light rays are diffusely spread about the retinal area, the back of your eye, and it leads to diminished ability to, um, sorry, it's caused by either the shape of your lens or your cornea, which will then distort the light rays entering the eye. Uh, going on to some vision disorders now. Our first vision disorder, amblyopia also known as lazy eye. 
and that is decreased eyesight due to abnormal visual de development that usually occurs early in childhood. So it can be due to the nerve pathways between the brain and the eye aren't properly stimulated and the brain may tend to favor one eye over the other. So symptoms can include a wandering eye, eyes that may not work together, or poor depth perception. Both eyes can be affected, and then treatment includes eye patches, eye drops, glasses, or contact lenses, sometimes surgery. Another vis vision disorder deals with strabismus, and that's a disorder in which the eyes don't look in the same direction at the same time, so it may appear as like cross-eyed. Causes of strabismus can include nerve injury, dysfunction of the muscles controlling the eyes, so that deals with cranial nerves three, four, and six. Main symptom is that the eyes don't look in the same direction at the same time. Uh, it can be manifested with cross eyes, and it can be corrected if it's uh, caught early in treatment. Uh, other treatment options include special eyewear, use of an eye patch, and then rarely surgery. Looking at diabetic retinopathy, that is a eye disorder that is becoming more and more prevalent as adolescents are um, more likely to develop diabetes, specifically diabetes type 2. Uh, but diabetic retinopathy, that's a condition of diabetes that affects the eyes and it's caused by the damage to the blood vessels in the tissue at the back of the eye, that retina. Um, causes are poorly controlled blood sugar. Early symptoms can include floaters, blurriness, dark areas of vision, and then difficulty perceiving color. Blindness can also occur if it's not corrected, if, if we're not... Uh, treating the blood sugars. We need to get those blood sugars lowered to decrease their chance of developing this. Um, advanced cases of diabetic retinopathy, they may require some kind of laser treatment or surgery. Cataracts now, normally our lens is clear in our eye. However, with cataracts, that lens becomes cloudy and that interferes with light's ability to move through the eye to the back of the eye where we need to stimulate that optic nerve and allow our brain to transmit what we're seeing. So symptoms of cataract can include blurred vision, inability to see in dim light, seeing halos around lights, or vision loss. Treatment includes replacing the affected lens with a clear artificial lens. And in some cases, like mine, I actually was either born with a cataract or acquired it due to some kind of trauma at an early age. And the eye doctors told me they didn't want to treat it. They didn't want to take it out because it could potentially cause an infection in my eye and that could travel over to my good eye. And then that would be no good. I'd have neither eyes. So in some cases, cataract surgery may not be the best option. Uh, looking at glaucoma, glaucoma is that increased intraocular pressure due to an excess accumulation of aqueous humor. And aqueous humor is the fluid that's more towards the anterior part of the eye versus the vitreous body, which is towards the back of the eye. Uh, so with glaucoma, we got open angle glaucoma, which tends to be chronic. Um, where symptoms may not appear at first. It can be treated with eye drops. Um, however, if it's allowed to proceed, it can slowly lead to uh, vision loss. Narrow angle glaucoma or acute angle glaucoma is a bit more rare, but it is more emergent. It's more of an emergency type issue. And we really got to get that treated quick. So um, symptoms with narrow angle glaucoma can include nausea, sudden visual disturbance, um, and treatment for that can center around surgery, possibly medications and eye drops. Uh, looking at photophobia, that's basically sensitivity to light. It can cause eye inflammation, 
uh, or can be due can be due to eye inflammation, corneal abrasions or ulcer, wearing contact lenses for too long, or lenses that fit poorly. Uh, can also be due to eye infection, certain eye diseases, or injury or recovering from an eye surgery. Meningitis is also another cause of photophobia. Migraine headaches, medications can cause photophobia. Light colored eyes, albinism, dry eyes, dilated pupils, and corneal abrasion. Our next eye disorder centers around conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye. And that is basically an irritation or inflammation of the conjunctiva, that mucous membrane um, underneath your eyelid. Uh, conjunctivitis can be caused by allergies, a bacteria, or a virus. Conjunctivitis is extremely contagious and is spread by contact with eye secretions from anyone who's infected. So a uh, very good idea to keep your bed linens clean. Um, if someone does come down with conjunctivitis in your household, don't be sharing um, any pillows, blankets. You want to wash them frequently. Um, conjunctivitis can lead to discharge or crusting around the eyes, inflammation, redness, pain, irritation. It's If you're a contact lens wearer, it's very important to stop wearing those contacts, throw them out while you're affected. Many times conjunctivitis can resolve on its own, but treatment can speed up the recovery process. Allergic conjunctivitis can be treated with antihistamines. Bacterial conjunctivitis should be treated with antibiotic eye drops or eye ointment. Keratitis is an inflammation of the cornea that's caused by either infection, injury, disease, or wearing contact lenses for too long. Symptoms can include eye redness, pain, blurred or decreased vision. Prompt medical attention is needed to avoid loss of vision with keratitis. Treatment includes medications such as antibiotics. In rare cases, an antifungal drug may, may need to be used if the causing agent is a fungus. One of the last eye disorders I wanna talk about is trachoma. And that's a bacterial infection that affects the eyes and is one of the leading preventable causes of blindness worldwide. It's very contagious, almost always affects both eyes. Symptoms can begin with mild itching, irritation of the eyelids and the eyes. It can progress to blindness and eye pain or blurred vision as well. Antibiotics can treat early stage trachoma Surgery is then leaded, needed in the later stages, so we really want to catch it early so that we can avoid surgery. Access to clean water and adequate sanitation are keys to prevention with trachoma. So that's about all I wanted to talk about with the eyes. I'm going to move into the ears now, and we want to talk about a couple different types of hearing loss that's associated with the ears. We have conductive hearing loss, which is where sounds cannot get through the outer and middle ear. Soft sounds are usually hard to hear, and then the louder sounds may be muffled. Medicine or surgery can often fix this type of hearing loss. Looking at sensorineural hearing loss, that is caused by damage to the tiny hair cells in the inner ear and is usually associated with aging or prolonged exposure to loud noise. Treatment includes hearing aids and assistive devices. Central deafness is a problem resulting from the disruption in the signals that transmit sound waves to the brain. And as a result, the hearing centers do not interpret the signals correctly. Occasionally, people with acquired deafness can be treated with a surgically implanted prosthesis also known as a cochlear implant, and that directly stimulates our spiral ganglion and then allows uh, some people to be able to uh, retrieve back their hearing. Central hearing loss tends to be rare when compared to sensorineural neural or conductive uh, hearing loss types. Some of the hearing disorders I wanna speak about include Meniere's disease, 
that usually starts in one ear but later may involve both. Smoking, infections, high sodium diet may worsen the disease. Symptoms include vertigo, like a spinning sensation, the room is spinning, hearing loss, ear ringing, which is also known as tinnitus, and then ear pressure. Uh, vertigo can cause severe nausea and imbalance um, because we know that the ear is responsible for not only hearing, but also for our equilibrium and our balance. So any kind of ear disorder can throw off the balance that is a severe safety risk. So as nurses, we definitely wanna consider our patient's safety if they are affected with some kind of um, ear disorder. Uh, drugs for Meniere's disease can include ones for motion sickness, nausea, that can help manage the symptoms. And if you do get hearing loss in Meniere's disease, it usually becomes permanent. Otitis media, that is infection of the air-filled space behind the eardrum, also known as the middle ear. And that's what connects to our eustachian tube, right? Our eustachian tube connects to the middle of our ear and connects to the throat. And that passageway is lined with mucous membranes. So bacteria that is colonizing our throat or bacteria that we're exposed to when we eat uh, can actually travel up the eustachian tube and cause otitis media, that infection, inflammation of our middle ear. And the eustachian tube is also there. You ask, well, why is it there? It's to help equalize pressure between the outside environment and the internal environment inside your ear. So common symptoms of otitis media, ear pain and fever with children or young infants who can't really speak to uh, the pain, you may see them pulling on their ear. Uh, less commonly, there may be drainage or fluid from the ear and possibly hearing loss. Many times ear infections go away on their own. However, some may require antibiotics, especially of the bacterial origin. All right, so that's all I wanted to talk about today with our eyes and ear disorders. Uh, for my Herzing students, I'm gonna be making a second video here that will uh, look to respiratory disorders and so these two, uh, couple topics here that I'm gonna be putting together in this video and then the next video that will correlate with our upcoming uh, modules and quiz. So uh, hope to see you in the next video that will concern respiratory disorders. I'm Scott Kruger. Thanks for joining me today in our lesson and our Patho for Nurses.